Yeah, we must never forget our giving is our worship. It is a worship. Uh, this morning we're going to continue in our series, um, Brighter and Brighter. If you'll put, I don't know if you have that graphic or not, but we talk about a light in the darkness, and um, I believe that that's the plan, and that's the that's his, God's desire. The Bible says that in Proverbs four eighteen that the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter, and so this morning we got. Um, I'm, I'm going to set up a message. Um, and kind of give you some ears, uh, or at least a, 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 I just believe what's to be heard in this house today, okay? Um, and so when, when we come and when we, when we you know, and a, a message is shared, it's not me teaching you as much as it is me feeding what I'm, I'm feeding on, <laughs> right? You know, in other words, like at my house, um, we don't really do chicken nuggets for one, macaroni for the other, hamburgers for this one. And like I grew up where what mom made, you ate. That's just how I, so that's just how it is in this house. Like, so when I'm serving goulash, <laughs> guess who's eating goulash? <laughs> Me. So uh, that's how it is. And so this morning, I mean, I believe if, 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 if I can't be eating what, what I'm serving, I think we should... Uh, was talking with Landon the other day. Uh, there was a statement, something along these lines. If I can't eat what I'm serving, we ought to just close the doors here. Yeah. Right? And so, um, but we're, we're going to continue uh, to, in this. In Proverbs 4.18 has been the, the, our main uh, verse for, this, uh, for this, this series, which is the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter. And we talked, uh, uh, I thought I was going to get right to the place of brighter and brighter. Um, but as I was going into this series, um, it seemed like I had to stop on the path, right? And then get to this place where all the, it seemed like the Lord was highlighting righteous uh, and just getting, getting, establishing some of the things uh, that need to be established before we get to even the brightness, which, lead, which is really the glory of God. Um, it's, uh, and so we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until, until full day. And we're going to talk this morning, the title of this morning's message is A Righteous Way. Have you ever heard the statement, uh, and maybe you've heard it, well, God can make a way when there is no way, right? So we're going to talk about a, a righteous way. You know there's a way that God can work, that when, when, there, when there seems to be no way, there is a way. And I was thinking, um, you know, as a, this is, here we are, Mother's Day, Father's Day, whatever day. You know, God has a really difficult job. I mean, think about this. You have how many kids? We got a, he's got a lot of kids. You know, sometimes your kids are all doing what, they, what you want them to do. Sometimes. Um, that's all, all's well when that happens. But what, what is God's approach to you and me when, when, they're not doing, when we're not doing what he desires of us? Not because what's, it's right or wrong, but because the Father's directions to us never have been about right and wrong. They've never been about condemnation. It's always been about life or death. And he wants life. Remember the tree? There's knowledge of good and evil. He said, no, eat the tree of life. He said, this right here, he, he, he wasn't about, you're going to die. This, this is the place of death. This is the place of life. It's always been, even when he said, I set before you life and blessing, death and cursing, choose life. He didn't say, you're wrong, you're dirty, you're this. He just said, this is life or this is death because he loves his children. And even when Jesus came, he said, I, I came, I God so loved the world that whoever believed in him, he, 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 they may have what? Oh, I know. So they might be not so dirty, not so bad, not so wrong, not so... No, it was always been about life. And, and so what is God's approach to you, to you and me when we're not doing what, what he knows leads to life? Write him off? Does he write you off? No. What does he do? I know what he does because he just gets livid. Just ticked off his you know he's not he's not he's not slow to anger he's just light a match i'm done quick no what does the bible say he's slow slow to anger abounding in mercy so there's an approach like think about this uh what is what is god's approach to his children did you know um 
that's all of us are our children. And really, we're brothers and sisters. And yet somehow, um, it's, it's, you know, have you ever had a brother or a sister that you're frustrated with? Anybody? May, and, and maybe uh, not because they wronged you, but maybe, maybe you've ever had a brother or a sister. Uh, maybe you're not old enough to have this, but you see them maybe making choices that are hurting them. And you just see that their, their life is not filled with the life that you want for them. And so you're frustrated with them, not because they're bad or not because, but just like, ah. And so you just, and anybody ever just get angry about it? Anybody ever get angry with their kids when they didn't do what you asked them to do, which was for their good, but they didn't do it, and so you just get angry? Okay. I'm going to give you a verse that will help you and me today. <clears throat> James chapter 1. Uh, Wherefore, brethren, this is 19 through 21, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to be angry, because the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. So the righteousness of God is God's way. Did you know our anger never brings about God's way? You know the only thing that brings about God's way? What does he do? What is his approach to you and me? Mercy. Listen to this out of Romans chapter 2. You therefore have no excuse who pass judgment on one another. For on whatever grounds you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the very same things. We know that God, God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, O oh man, pass judgment on others, yet you do the same thing, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? Again, I'm just, I'm, I'm, why are we talking about the verses that lead up to verse 4? Because we're all God's children. <laughs> okay? And all of us have found ourselves in that place where we're not doing what have you ever not done what the Lord wants you to do, but then you're upset with that person for not doing what the Lord wants them to do. Anybody? Maybe I'm the only one as a pastor, like, or your children. Why are you not doing what you, I want you will want you to do, which is the right thing to do. <laughs> so when you pass judgment, uh, you do the same thing. He says, do you think you'll escape, escape God's judgment or do you disregard? And he says, Disregard the riches of his kindness. This is, what he, this is what he does with your and my will to bring about a righteous way. Here's what he does. He says he, he's kind and patient because that's the only thing that can lead to repentance. See, repentance, God, the goal is not conformity. It's choice. See, my children, you're going to tell your mom Happy Mother's Day. Oh, that, she doesn't want that. Does she? No. Um, I, 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 I don't want an apology unless you want to ap give an apology. You understand? You don't go tell your brother you're sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Hold, go stand there nose to nose, right? I mean, we've done this. Hug. You're going to hug for a minute, falling over, angry. It, that doesn't do anything, does it? Other than just make everybody, you know, more frustrated. It's kind of funny to watch, you know. Especially when they're teenagers. But it is mercy. It is mercy. It's kindness that leads to repentance. What does God do with our wills? He shows kindness. Even when we don't will to do his will. Trusting, this is love, that it won't fail. By faith. This is faith. This is faith to have the very thing that you love more than anything else. That you want more than anything else. To be allowed to make a choice to hurt itself. And just show kindness. Speak the truth in love. Trusting that that goodness will lead them home. The same kindness that leads the, you lead, led you and me back to Christ or back to God's way, a righteous way, is still leading people back to God's way. And so we're going to talk this morning about a righteous way. I'm going to take about seven, eight minutes here, and then I'm going to play a message for you, a message that I've listened to, um, and it, it, it very, uh, very right for, for this moment, for this time. Uh, by a friend of ours and also a minister that's been here a number of times. Uh, how many of you know Jeremy and Sarah Pearsons? 
Okay, uh, they pastor a church out in Legacy. They used to travel, um, and now they're pastoring a church, so they don't really get out to travel much um, anymore. But uh, if, if you'll put up Second Corinthians five nineteen through twenty one, he says this. Second Corinthians five nineteen through twenty one. A righteous way. How are you and me made righteous? How, this is how God's way comes about. Okay, this is. He says this. That it, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting. So, how did He bring people back to Himself? Not counting. Not counting their trespasses against them, and trusting to us. How not? He, he had to count them until Christ. But in Christ, this is a righteous way. Christ, a right, the righteous way. He, in Christ, He was reconciling or bringing back, making amends the world to Himself. He said, by not counting their trespasses against them. So because the trespasses aren't counted, that was the way back because they were paid for through Christ. He goes on to say, and entrusting to us the ministry, the ministry or, or the message of reconciliation. So guess what? You and me, the same way that God brought his children back, he said, I'm going to give you this ministry or you this message of reconciling or bringing people back to God. And you can't do it by exerting your will over their will. As a pastor, sometimes I just want to, do you smell what the rock is cooking? (laughs) You know? Just live it, just, but you know what? The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. You can get so frustrated Because you're like, do you not see genuine, out of a place of genuine love and desire for well-being and move you into a place of just mad, angry, frustrated. I've been there. God, what do you want to do? I don't even know what to do. I feel like my hands are tied. Yeah, that's what I feel like sometimes too. But they're not. Here's how. So this is what this is, a righteous way. A righteous way. So you know um, what's prophesying to you or what's speaking to you about your kids, about what's going on, is oftentimes because you're counting certain things, and this adds up to this, and this adds up to this, and this adds up to this, so that means they're just going to hell. This adds up to this, this adds up to this, that that means, you know what that adds up to? Uh, Divorce. This adds up, this adds up, this adds up, this adds up. You know what that adds up to? This. And so you and me are convinced not about what God says about a situation, about our kids, but about what we can add up. And entrust in them, but he's given to you and to me this ministry of reconciling or bringing God back. But when I stand in this place of frustration, anger, because I've judged something a certain way, I can't even speak the truth to you in love. Because you're wearing me out. Come on, help me out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, Drew, you'll find out soon. You get married pretty soon. Next one. Therefore, we are ambassadors, sent ones for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. How is he going to make the appeal, you know? Till they tap out, put the headlock, you know? Full Nelson, get the chair. No, no. We implore you in Christ's behalf, implore you be reconciled back to God. Next verse. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You're made the righteousness of God. How? Through Jesus. One of the things that you, we're going we're I'm, I'm, to let this next message really hit on that piece there. Um, but I wanted to sit, show you that, that little piece. So 1 Corinthians 12, 31. There is a more excellent way. We, we quoted uh, and, and read over the moms today, 1 Corinthians 13, the way of love. Here in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's all about the gifts of the Spirit, right? Like miracles, signs, wonders, prophecy. I just need a word from God. I just need this. I just need that. I wish I could just have a miracle. I could just have, like, I just need this, right? And the Lord's like, let me show you a more excellent way. This, let me show you what you really need. And that's this way, the way, right? We're talking about a way. We're talking about a path that leads leads to our path brighter and brighter, a way that's brighter and brighter. And the way that leads brighter and brighter, it's a way of love. 
It's the way of love. This is the last verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the more excellent way, right before he talks the next, in, in 1 Corinthians 13 about love. All right. Uh, now, James chapter 3. You know what's crazy? <laughs> hmm. Did you know that part of you and me are playing on the same team as Christ? Okay. Have you, have you heard it said this? Well, I don't want to come to church because I don't want to be judged, maybe? So God not counting men's trespasses against them. But we as the church, we're on the same team. We have the ministry of reconciliation, right? Well, we're playing the same team. So what I'm going to do, God's not going to hold the judge and keep score. So someone's got to keep score. So we'll just do it. We'll just be the umpire and we'll just keep the score, church. Can we just keep score? That way that people, no, he says, and you know what's crazy is when you and I, he, he says, but if you, this is what happens so oftentimes. When you and I are frustrated or upset about something, there's a couple things that happen. It says this, but if you have bitter jealousy or selfish ambition or strife in your heart, do not boast or be false to the truth. So either you're talking about it, either you're boasting about what's going on, about your child or that person, or blah, 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 whoever, whatever situation, either you're boasting about it, and no, 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 and you're boasting about it, that means you have to exert yourself and your righteous judgment about the right way that leads to life that you really want for them, but it's not working for them. <laughs> or you have to lie about it and say, oh, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not upset with them, but it's yet you're still talking about it. Uh, no, 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 listen, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So the fact that it's on your mouth is proof that it's in your heart and that there, in your heart there is, there is this desire for you to see it to be made the right way. What you, what you deem the right way. Right? And we know that we just read in Romans that, that your judgment is not just, but God's judgment is just because God knows you only know what you know. You only know what you know, which isn't very much. You don't know what was heard, what was said. You don't know what they heard of what you said. You don't know what was the past. and the, the, We don't know, but what we do know is that we've been given this ministry of reconciliation where we don't count men's trespasses against them. Okay. You know, you've heard, um, you've heard it, Jesus talk about forgiving, right? He said, if you can't forgive me, I can't forgive you. That was pre-cross. Okay, that was pre-cross. Yet he, he mentions it multiple times as it must have some pretty serious stuff. But then after that, we see that Paul talking to the church tells us, he doesn't give us the same statement that, that you're not going to be forgiven by God if you can't forgive. But he does tell us that what's going to happen is you're moving yourself from the place of receiving God's mercy to the place of judgment. How you judge You'll be judged. So if you want to stay in the place of grace or stay in the place of receiving from God what he, his mercy affords versus receiving from God what your works afford, then your my forgiveness is a must. When I don't forgive somebody, what happens is I'm judging them by their works and the same way I'm judging them, I will to be judged. So... When I'm holding strife and bitterness or whatever against somebody, what, what I'm positioning myself is to get the rewards of my works. And that is a very hellacious path. It's not a bright path, is it? Because you know what? What I know, I'm one of God's kids. And I don't always do what I know I should do or what he would like me to do. And guess what? Justice will prevail. But you know what God wants? He doesn't want justice. He wants mercy to triumph over justice. Isn't that interesting? God wants mercy to triumph over justice. Did you know what God desires mercy to triumph over judgment or justice is still, or judgment is still what he desires for to be happening in the church as people on his team reconciling those back to Christ reconcile. There should be this, they're, they're, we shouldn't be such good counters. All right. 
Okay, last two verses before we hit this play on this message, all right? It's a 50-minute message. You're going to be jacked that you got to be here and heard all this. And this, is, this right here is the answer to a bright path. Like there's so many things going on right, right now in your life, just, or you're going to hit anything that has to do with relationship, which is crazy about relationships. Everybody's sitting next to somebody. So there's going to be smell or, come on, man, who's, you ever sit there in church? Anybody? Come on, right? Like, like come on, bro. Like, who did that? All right. Come on. All right. All right. Let's go. Praise, praise the Lord. Or in the movie theater, you're like, oh, man, this was a good part until that hit my nose. <laughs> Ephesians 4.23, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. How did he forgive you? In Christ. So the Christ part is a huge part. In Christ. Because there had to be payment. Justice prevailed in Christ. So if I want justice and I want to receive it according to not my works, but according to his works, I'm going to have to, it's going to have to be in Christ. Okay. So the path of the righteous, the path of those who are in Christ shines brighter and brighter and brighter. Now go up to verse 29 and we're going to read that for 29 through 32 talking about this. <clears throat> he says this. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth. And we just talked about this, didn't we? When, when you're angry in your heart, when you're frustrated in your heart, when you're unforgiving in your heart, it's interesting he has to start it up by saying, let no corrupt talk come out of our mouth, but only which is such as good for a building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear it. Next verse. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Did you know it grieves him when it grieves the Holy Spirit? Let me say it this way. It, it stifles oh, the, the, the helper. The helper, let me say it this way, it ties him up. In the situation where the, what you and me need, you and I, me, you and me, whatever, we need, what we need is we need him to work. Hmm? Because wasn't it his work that drew us to... So, you know, you and me can hinder people's path of repentance by the words of our mouth because we're letting corrupt... Remember it was the Holy Spirit that drew man, drew you and me? So I, I need the Holy Spirit to do some drawing. So if I want him to be on the loose, I need to make sure that I tie this thing up. Next verse, he says, uh, you were sealed with the day of redemption. Not, do not grieve the, the Holy Spirit. Next verse, 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Get that away from me. Get that thing out of my face. <laughs> you know, it's like, roll the windows down. Somebody get that out of the car. Get that out of here. Get that out. I mean, it's got to, this kind of talk or this kind of anything that would, it's got to be like a stench that you just want out of. Turn on the fan. Close the door. I got kids, all right? Get it out of here. Clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Why? Along with anger. Why? Because anger, if I'm angry, I cannot work God's way. We just read this in James, that anger does not work or bring about the righteousness of God. Next verse. But be kind instead. Choose kindness. Well, that could be mercy. But instead, choose mercy. Be tenderhearted, forgiving one another. How? As God forgave you in Christ. Or as God in Christ forgave you. Wow, that's pretty cool, isn't it? That's this side of the cross. He doesn't say you're not going to be forgiven. He tells us how to, to be on God's side and partner with him. Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 13. So uh, as those of you have, have chosen God, holy and beloved, put on, what does he say? On a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, Bearing one another and forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also should you. So he tells us how to, how to do it as Christ. Remember how Christ forgave you. That's how you forgive them. And then here's what happens. Instead of unwholesome talk coming out of your mouth, your mouth, but the Bible tells us in James, we know that our mouth has a whole lot to do with the direction of our life and what we just heard, the direction of others' lives. There's no such thing as private sin. Personal, not private. My words, just as they can direct my life, they can direct your children's life, you worthless piece of 
You can't do anything right. You're just so fat. You, you're no good. You're ugly. You're like, why can't you be like you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, your words, my words. My words can direct somebody's life just like they direct my life. He says this, but if, if, if you and I will, he said, uh, chosen of God, he said, if we'll put on a heart of compassion, a heart of kindness, a heart of humility, a heart of gentleness and patience, and if we'll bear with one another and forgive one another, he said, just as Christ forgave us, here's what will happen. Our path will be one of singing. Direction of our lives will become that one of rejoicing and brighter. We'll be singing about our children We'll be singing about our friends. We'll be singing about, like, look what the Lord has done. And all over all these put on love, verse 14, which is the bond of perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Don't let what you're counting be the rule. For to this you were called as members, and be thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Um, teaching, admonishing one another with all wisdom. And as you sing... And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart, you'll do everything for the glory of God. So, that was the setup. Kind of a mouthful to kind of have you hear a righteous way, God's way. And you get to hear uh, the next 50 minutes, a uh, message by Jeremy Pearson's talking on love. So, hit it, maestro. I think there's some faith in the room today. That makes a big difference. You know that, right? It makes a big difference the way you listen. Jesus said you know, on more than one occasion, take heed how you hear. Take heed. Not a word we use much anymore. It just simply means pay attention. And what's he saying? Pay attention to how you pay attention. Pay attention to how much attention you're giving. And he's talking about to his word. Pay attention to the way you pay attention. You and I both know that it's possible for the words that come out of your mouth to hit another person's eardrums without them really, really listening or getting what you're saying. We've all experienced that. You know what it's like. If you've had teenagers, you know what it's like. I pastored teenagers for six years, and I know what it's like sometimes to talk, and they're looking at you. It's like the lights are on, but you're wondering, is anybody home? That wasn't always that way, and not with all of them, but you know what it's like to talk, and, and it seems like the words are just kind of bouncing off their ears. When I first started to learn to play guitar, I suffered from what I call guitar face. And if you don't know what guitar face is, then you've never tried to talk to somebody while they play guitar. Because if they're playing while you're talking, they are not listening to you. And they just kind of give you that, that deep, empty stare. It also uh, applies to husbands when they're watching television. I'm telling you, this invention that has come about in our lifetime, the ability to pause live TV, it's saving marriages all over the world. <laughs> You know what it's like. Come on, ladies, help me out. You know what it's like. You've got something you want to say, and the game is on, and he's watching, and you come in the room, and his head turns towards you, but his eyes never leave the screen. And you're talking, and he's going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you're like, what did I just say? <laughs> he says, uh-huh. What's wrong? TV face. He's not paying attention to how he's paying attention. <laughs> Jesus, say, Jesus said, pay attention to how you pay attention. And the way you and I attend unto the word, like we've already talked about today, if we'll put value on it, we'll get more out of it. Amen? Amen. Didn't Sarah do an awesome job last Sunday? That was tremendous. Uh, one of the first and only times I've ever been able to watch our own church live. I was out on the East Coast preaching in North Carolina. 
course, a couple of hours ahead there. So when we got done with church, you guys were just getting started. So I jumped on and I watched the whole thing and I just thought everybody did such an awesome job. What an anointed message. It was the right word and exactly what we needed to hear. And I actually want to continue on with what she started last week. I believe the Lord's wanting to continue to talk to us along those same lines. So open your Bibles with me again to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to keep, keep going in this series that we began several weeks ago, What's Right With You? You need to find out what's right with you. Somebody say, there's something right with me. And there is, it's true. There's something right with you and it's right with you right now. And like we've already said, people live with this constant and acute awareness of everything that's wrong with them. If you were to ask somebody, hey, what's up? What's wrong? You okay? Most people could give you a laundry list of everything that's not right. Everything that's not right with them, either physically, pain in the body, pain in the soul, the heart, pain mentally, financially, relationally, things that are wrong in any and every area of life. But as believers, we need to, instead of magnifying the things that are wrong with us, we've got to find out what's right with us and begin to magnify what's right with us. Because if you'll find out what's right with you, it'll fix what's wrong with you. Magnifying what's wrong with you has never served to fix what's wrong with you. It can't do it. But when you find out what's right with you, it'll fix anything that's wrong with you. And here in 2 Corinthians 5 is where we find out there is something right with us. In verse 17, you've heard it before. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what is he? A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. You could say it like this. God was not holding your sin against you. If God was holding sin against us, man, we would be in a world of hurt. There'd be no hope for us if he was holding sin against us. But he's not. He's not holding sin against us. And David in the Old Testament, standing in the office of the prophet, looking forward to the day that you and I were living in, he said it like this, blessed is the man to whom God does not impute his sin. That person is blessed the one that God doesn't hold it against him. It's impossible to have a good relationship with somebody who won't let stuff go. It is impossible to build any kind of thriving fellowship and relationship with somebody if they are constantly bringing stuff up. If they're constantly bringing up your past and what you did and what you messed up in and everything you said wrong, and even if it happened Decades ago, they, they seem to find a way to work it into the conversation. And it's impossible to have a real thriving relationship with somebody who won't let it go. Aren't you glad God is somebody who won't let it? Did I say that wrong? Aren't you glad God's not somebody who won't let it go? He let it go. He's not holding it against you. You got to understand the power of the blood of Jesus. And when we repent... It restores that relationship. He said, uh, God was in Christ, verse 19, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we're ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us on Christ, uh, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, here's what's right with you. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is what's right with you. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. And that word righteous is just kind of an old English word. It just simply means right. You see it in other translations like this. New Living says it this way. God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin 
so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And the Amplified Classic says, through him we might become the righteousness of God, what we ought to be, approved and acceptable and in right relationship with him by his goodness. How did we get back into this right relationship with him? Was it by your goodness? Was it by you doing something right? Well, think about how it all started. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. He had to be made sin. It wasn't because he sinned that he went to the cross. He had to be made that way. Well, you and I weren't called righteous because of all the righteous things we did. We had to be made, or I like to say it like this, remade. How did you become the righteousness of God? You were reborn that way. It's your new nature. It's your new DNA. You were reborn the righteousness of God in Christ. You were made right with him. You were approved. And he says, you have been restored to a right relationship with God. And the way we got that way was we were reborn that way. And this is why the last time I was with you, I led, led you in this confession, which to me is perhaps one of the strongest confessions of faith that anybody can make. One of the, a confession that I would say requires more faith than just about anything. So I want to lead you in it again. And I want you to say this after me if you believe it. Say this, I am, I am. the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, why is it that confession requires so much faith? You want to know why? It's because you have eyes and you can see everything that's wrong with you. You know you so well and you can see every fault. You can see every flaw. You were there when you sinned, like right there. You were an eyewitness to what you did wrong. You were a firsthand witness to the sin, to the mistake, to the flaw, to the mess up. And maybe it was one of those things you had done a thousand times before. And you see all of that. That's why it requires so much faith for you to see all of that and still say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Because you can see that. That's what this whole chapter, and even beginning in the chapter before this, is all about. The Spirit of God speaking through Paul is helping us recognize the difference between things that are seen and things that are unseen. I want you to back up into chapter 4 and look towards the end of that chapter in verse 17. He said, we do not lose heart. You could say we don't give up. We don't quit even though our outward man. What is the outward man? That's the part you can see. Our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man. What's the inward man? Well, if the outward man is the part you can see, the inward man is the part you can't see. The inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen. We do not look at the things which are seen. We do not look at the things which are seen. Now, every time he says we, he is delineating between us and them. Who is us? Us is the born again child of God. Us is the new creation that he's getting ready to talk about. Us is the household of faith. Us, we, this is who we are. And there is a difference between us and them. There's a massive difference between those who know God and love God and those who don't know him, don't love him, don't want anything to do with him. As a matter of fact, that is the biggest difference that could possibly exist between two human beings. The biggest differences between us are not skin tone. 
The biggest differences between us are not where we're from, nationality, families we were born into or not born into. The biggest differences between us are not socioeconomic. They're not financial differences. And yet our enemy is working overtime right now in this world, trying to magnify all these differences and trying to get people to believe that these are the big differences well, you're this color and you're that shade, so that's a massive difference between you. You're this gender and you're that one, and you're, well, we're not quite sure. He's tried to magnify all these major differences. These are not the big differences. The biggest difference that could possibly exist between two human beings is one knows God and one doesn't. That's who he's talking about. We. We. And he said, we live different. We do not look at the things that are seen. Now, this is perhaps one of the biggest challenges to your life and walk of faith. Because what you can see can be so distracting. It can be in your face all the time. But we don't look at it. We don't look at what is seen. That's how I can stand here today and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Even though I know what I did, I was there when I did it. And I was there when I did it again. And I did it again. And I did it again. And I know every fault and I know every flaw. I was there. I've seen it all, but I ain't looking at the things that are seen. I'm looking at what's unseen. And because of that, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. He goes on. He says, we don't look at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. That's what we're looking at. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now this flows right into chapter five where we began, but look at verse one. He's still talking about things you can see, things you can't see. He says, we know that if our earthly house, this tent, He's referring to this physical body that you and I live in. We know if this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He's talking about the body you can see and the body you can't see. I can see, looking across this room right now, the tent that you're living in. I can see it. It's physical. It's material. I can see it. We do have another one, however. We have a house made by God. Now you don't see it yet, but he says in verse two, for in this, we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. That's what the groaning's about. I, I laugh at myself now as I'm a little deeper into my forties, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. I'm 43 at this point. Um, it's the oldest I've ever been. <laughs> Never been this old before. And I'm enjoying it, doing everything I can to get healthier, stronger all the time. I do hear myself making sounds I never made before. Do I have any other honest men in here who know exactly what I'm talking about? I never made a sound when sitting down before. Now, just that simple act comes with all kinds of, eh, oh, mm. I call them old man sounds. And we tend to groan, don't we? Just like he said, we groan as these bodies, these physical tents get older and older. Well, we groan. But here's what you and I need to understand as believers. We're not groaning because these things are getting older. He says it's a longing. It's a longing for that body that God made for us. So I'm going to go with that. That's what I'm going with. These aren't old man sounds. These are just, God, give me that new body. He said in verse three, if indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. That's good news. For we, I'm thankful for clothes, y'all. I'm so grateful. Just cover all kinds of stuff. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed. It's not that I want to die and get rid of this thing. I just want to be, he said, further clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared 
us for this very thing is God who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. All of this is talking about the difference between what you can see, what you can't see. So we are always confident, verse 6, knowing that while we are at home in the body, in what you can see, we are absent from the Lord. While we're in this world where we see these things, we're not in that world where we see him. He's still unseen to us. So what's the answer to this? Verse 7. We walk by faith and not by what you can see. So that right there shows you that the walk of faith is learning to see what you can't see. Learning to look at things that are unseen. Now skip down to verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. If we're of sound mind, it's for you. I want you to notice this today. Verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus. If you're taking notes, making notes, I want you to draw your attention to this word judge. We judge thus. What do we judge? That if one died for all, then all died. He says, this is how we judge. Now this word judge just means to decide. And he said, what we've decided is that if one, talking about Jesus, died for all, then all died. But notice what he said before that. The love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ compels us. Why don't you say it? The love of Christ compels me. Now, the King James uses a different word. It uses the word constrains or constraineth. The love of Christ constrains me. Here you see the love of Christ compels me. It's an interesting word, especially when you discover it gets translated those two different ways because they, they really sound like different things. To be compelled means to be urged on. It, it, to me, it means motivated to act, to do something. Constrained, though, has the idea of setting limitations where you don't act. It's the same word used in scriptures that talk about the huge crowds that gathered around Jesus, that thronged him in such a crowd that people couldn't even move. And at times there were those that were trampling each other, that just a thick crowd like that. I don't know if you've ever experienced it. Disney World, um, Walmart, the day after Thanksgiving, the crowds, you can't move. It's, you're, you are constrained. You, you want to go. You, you want to go down, down aisle six, but you can't because the crowd is constraining, limiting, stopping you. So you've got one word that talks about you being motivated to go, another word that talks about you not able to go, and yet it's the same thing. The love of Christ is doing both of those things. The love of Christ is motivating action and the love of Christ is limiting action. The love of Christ motivates thinking and speaking. The love of Christ limits thinking and speaking. That's why other translations don't use compel or constrain. They use the word control. The love of Christ controls me. And he said, in response to this, because I am compelled, constrained, controlled by the love of God, this is how I judge. This is the decision I've come to. Why? Because of love. The decision I've come to is that if he died for all, all died. Bear, bear with me. Stay, there. Stay with this. Verse 15 again, if he died for all, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, or because of this love that compels, constrains, controls me, because I've decided that if Jesus died for all, all died. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, what's the flesh? That's the part you can see. What's he saying? 
Love won't let me look at you like that. Love won't let me, one translation says, evaluate you according to what I can see. Won't let me. Love says you can't go there. Not in your thoughts, not in your words, and not in your actions. It's constraining. It's, it's setting limitation. Because of love, I don't look at anyone according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, verse 17, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. I'm seeing something, church, as we dig into this that I've not been quick enough to see. Even after spending years and years, my whole life, looking at these things and growing up around these things, we've taken that that confession that I just led you in a moment ago. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And we talked about how much faith it takes and how you have to make the decision. I'm not looking at what I can see. I'm not looking at my past. I'm not looking at my failures. I'm not looking at the mistakes I made a decade ago or 10 minutes ago. I'm looking at what I can't see. I am looking at what Jesus has done for me in the spirit. He's made me the righteousness of God in Christ. That's powerful. That's good. That's right. But when you take that one truth and you disconnect it from everything else he's talking about here, you miss out on really the heart of what he's saying. So I'm going to lead you in another confession. And this one, I think this one might require even more faith than the first one. And it's going to require you to look at the person sitting next to you. So go ahead and say this after me. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Whoa. Whoa. Now, why does that one? will require as much, if not more, faith than the first one. Same reason. Same reason. Because you can see every mistake, every flaw. You may have been there, depending on how close that person is to you. You may have been there when they made the mistake. You may have spent the last decade or two married to that person and got a front row view to the faults, the flaws, the missteps, the mistakes, the sins, the, the anger, the temper, the, huh? You may have seen any and all of it, but faith looks at them and says, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. There's such a weightiness to what I'm telling you right now. It'll save relationships. And that's what this whole passage is about. Relationship. Right? We've been restored to right relationship with God. But what did Paul say? We've been reconciled. And then God turned around and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It makes me laugh sometimes when I think about the huge gap that existed between God and man. Just an impossible gap to try to bridge and cross. It It was bigger than from one end of the universe to the other. That's how much space and distance there was between us and God. That's how much distance our sin put between us and him. And through Jesus and the ministry of reconciliation, He closed that gap. He bridged that gap forever. And it's funny to me, and it would be funny if it wasn't so sad, that if God can bridge a gap like that, what's this little thing between me and you? We're not a universe apart here. Come on. If he can bridge that, certainly we can fix this little thing, right? Certainly, after all, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We have that in us. 
The thing that he did to bridge the gap between us and him, that's been given to us and now we can do that with each other. What is this thing between me and you? What is this thing between y'all? What's, what's this thing between husband and wife that it can't be fixed in a moment of time by the same mercy and grace that brought us back to God and yet we stand back and go, no, 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 just too much, too much, too far apart. You want to fix that? And in a hurry, declare the same thing over them that you declare over you. They are the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah, but I saw what they did. I'm not looking at what they did. I'm looking at what he did. I'm not looking at the things that are seen. I'm looking at what's unseen. This will change discussions. Even ones that get a little heated, where the volume gets turned up a little bit, and as it begins to escalate, and man, you've been laying in bed at night just working on that comeback because you knew this argument was coming, and you crafted it, and you formed it, and you thought, oh, you just say it again, and let you, let you hear what's about to come out of me, and I'm going to put you in your place, and here it comes. It's welling up on the inside of you, but instead you look at them and say, you know what you are? You, I'll tell you what you are. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm going to the other room. You can do that. You can do that. And it's faith, man. It's faith. We walk by faith and not by what we saw them do. We walk by faith. Faith for who they are in Christ. And we've heard so many good teachings and so many wonderful things about love and the love of God, but I know me and a lot, uh, uh, like some of you, we've heard that, and, and somewhere along the, walk, the way, love got twisted, and we, we turned love into maybe something that it's not, and, well, I got to do this because that's what love would do, or I'll do it like that because that's what love would do, and, and, and there's been a lot of confusion about it. This is love. This right here is love. The love of Christ compels and constrains. It urges me to act and it limits my actions because I judge thus. If he died for all, then all died. What's he saying? If Jesus died as your substitute, heaven holds it that you died. Heaven records you went to the cross. That is how powerful the substitutionary sacrifice is. It's not that he just did it for you. He did it for you. I, I, I struggle to even put it into the right words. It's as though you paid the price. That's what Paul's saying. I judge you like this. You already died. That's why he said, you're a new creation. See, we've, we love claiming that, don't we? I'm a new creation in Christ. I am a new creation in Christ. Old things, dead, passed away. All things become new. Okay, well, that same truth and reality that you believe about you, what are you supposed to do with that? Apply that to them. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That old, that old man that you were, dead and gone. Even if he was just in the room five minutes ago. Because sometimes the old man shows up, doesn't he? You, I'll, I'll tell you what you are. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And leave it at that. That's love. That's love. Thank you, Lord. Say it again. The love of Christ compels me. Can I read something to you here that I wrote? I feel like the Lord gave this to me. I'm just going to read it the way he gave it to me. If I'm constrained by the love of Christ for you, then his love has set limitations and boundaries that will restrict my words and actions towards you. If I am constrained by the love of Christ, then the foundation of my view for you actually has nothing to do with you. 
It has to do with Jesus. The love of Christ limits my thinking to the fact that Christ died for you, and if Christ died for you, then heaven's records show that you died. Therefore, I can no longer regard you according to your flesh. The love of God restricts me from thinking of you that way, and it compels me to think of you as someone who is worthy of the blood of Jesus. We find this hard to do because of one reason. We have eyeballs. <laughs> we can see so clearly the mistakes that have been made and others' faults seem so glaringly obvious, making it difficult to see a person apart from their actions. But this chapter in 2 Corinthians has a solution for that. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Relationships require us to walk by faith and not by what we see. For your relationships with other people to thrive, you'll have to learn to look at other people, not through your natural eyes, but through the eyes of faith. You see yourself through the eyes of faith when you say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Now simply say the same thing about the other people in your life, particularly about those who you know are born again. My spouse is the righteousness of God in Christ. Even if you're dealing with someone who's still living in sin and hasn't accepted the gift of righteousness, still you can say, Jesus died for them. Now, whether they believe it or have put faith in it or not, still he died for them. I give you a few examples here. Jesus died for my supervisor. Jesus died for every one of my coworkers. Jesus died for my city officials. Jesus died for the president of the United States. Jesus died for every senator, every congressperson. Here's one. Jesus died for my mother-in-law. What are you doing when you're saying that? You're putting value on them. Think of someone you're at odds with right now. Someone who has hurt you with their words or their actions. Think of someone whose life seems to despise and belittle everything you hold dear and count valuable. Now say out loud, out loud, Jesus died and rose again, and then put their name in there for them. Just as he did for me. Now listen, Jesus put value on their life when he shed his blood and paid to ransom them from sin. Who am I? to despise what he values? Who am I to call worthless what he calls priceless? The love of Christ won't let me judge any other way. What does judge mean? Decide. Decide. We know that in our, in our judicial system. The judges that we have in place whether they're local, county, state, all the way up to the Supreme Court, their job is to pass down decisions. Decisions. But now in that, in that particular setting and situation, it is a qualified decision. Qualified by their knowledge of the law. Qualified by their experience. Here's a big one. Qualified by their knowledge of the facts. Hmm. That's what the decision about another person comes out of. But I want you to see this as we begin to wrap it up. In Matthew chapter 7, go there with me, and look at something Jesus said. Who am I to belittle what he values? Who am I to call worthless what he calls priceless. We're going to read something here in Matthew chapter 7, but you got to understand that Matthew chapter 7 flows right out of Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew chapter 6 is where you and I hear the words of Jesus, and he says it over and over again, do not worry about your life. He said, don't worry about your clothes, what you put on. Don't worry about the food that you're going to eat. He's saying, don't worry about your finances. Don't worry about your provision. And he said it a number of times, do not worry. But what's interesting about that statement that Jesus made, do not, you see it 
quite a lot through the Gospels. When you look it up, you find out that it's actually some of the strongest, most prohibitive language that he could have used. And other translations will translate it differently, and perhaps the way it should have been translated, they actually translate it like this, stop it. Not do not worry. What did he say? Stop worrying. Stop it. How could Jesus look at a crowd of people, a bunch of nameless faces, and tell all of them to stop worrying? How could he do that? Surely there's some in the crowd that aren't, right? It's the nature of the flesh. And that's what he was dealing with. It is the nature of the flesh to worry. And people say, well, it's only natural that I worry. And to that I say, you're exactly right. It is only natural. And that is exactly why Jesus said, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop what? Stop worrying about your life. And a lot of people, particularly people who have gotten a hold of some things regarding the grace of God, if you're not careful how you hear it, if you don't pay attention to how you pay attention, you hear this said a lot. Well, I I just don't like religion and all the do's and the don'ts. Christianity is not a bunch of do's and don'ts. Have you ever heard anybody say that before? Christianity is not a bunch of do's and don'ts. I'm not into all the do's and don'ts. Okay, I know what you're saying, but be honest and read the Bible and read Jesus and what he said. He gave you some do's and he gave you some don'ts. And one of the big don'ts here is do not stop worrying. That's one of the don'ts. Stop worrying about your life. The reason I said that to you is because you get to chapter seven, verse one, and you see the exact same thing when he says, judge not that you be not judged. Do not judge could have and maybe should have been translated how? Help me out, church. Stop it. Stop it. You see this in the Weiss translation. He says, stop pronouncing censorious criticism in order that you may not be the object of censorious criticism. Censorious, what's that mean? To be severely critical of others. And he didn't just say, don't judge. What did he say? Stop judging. How could Jesus look at a big crowd of people? This is not a one-on-one counseling session. This is not Jesus marriage counseling across the desk with somebody. He is talking to a massive crowd of people and he says to every single one of them, stop worrying. And what else? Stop judging. And just as I'm sure there were people in the crowd that say, you know, I don't really have a worry problem. It's the nature of the flesh. And if you don't consciously and purposefully and by faith stop worrying, you will worry. Same thing goes with judging. He said, stop judging. What should that tell you? It's happening. It's happening everywhere and all the time criticizing. I know my grandfather tells a story. I heard him tell this years ago. He, I think this happened in the eighties in a time of prayer and fellowship with the Lord. He said to him, what is the biggest problem in the body of Christ? This is my grandfather asking the Lord this. What is the biggest problem in the body of Christ? And I think it surprised him, but he got an answer right away. And he said, he heard the Lord speak up on the inside of him. And he said, it is your dogged determination to correct one another. Constantly criticizing, correcting, judging. Jesus is so serious about this that he looks at the crowd and says, stop judging. But do you know how many people today, if you were to say, hey, that was judgmental, they'd say, oh, no, no, I wasn't judging. Nobody acknowledges when they're judging. And if everybody who is not judging really isn't judging, then there's really no reason for Jesus to say this. But what's he saying? Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. Doing what? Judging, criticizing, finding fault. He says, don't judge. Stop judging that you be not judged. What's he telling us? 
that criticizing other people opens wide the door to you being criticized, to you being judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. Now, there's a lot of people that would tell you right now, well, all God's judgment went on Jesus at the cross. So I don't have any risk of any more judgment. What did he just say? Well, that was before the cross. Well, then Jesus should have said, judge not, so you're not judged. But really, you know, in a few minutes here, I'm going to the cross, so that's not really going to apply anymore, so don't worry about it. That's not what he said. He's telling you how you judge other people is how you get judged. With what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and don't even think about the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, there's a plank in your eye. Jesus calls you a hypocrite. And if there's any group of people Jesus was not a fan of, it was the hypocrites. And the word hypocrites, a Greek word that just translates to actor. This is what it means. Actor. That's what they called their actors. Hypocrites. And this year's Academy Award for Best Male Hypocrite, that's what they referred to them as. And that's what Jesus was saying. And even other translations say that. He would say, you actors on the stage of life pretending to be something you're not. And he was not a fan of this. Judging, passing down a decision against somebody and criticizing them based only on what you see requires you to be a hypocrite, an actor. And nobody in here is qualified to judge. You're not qualified. I'm not qualified. You don't know the law that good. I don't know the law that good. Let me tell you what else doesn't qualify you. Or from, uh, what else keeps you from being qualified to judge? You never have all the facts. And Jesus said, why are you looking at your brother going, you, 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 got, you got something in your eye, a speck. What's he say? You got a problem. I can fix what's wrong with you. He said, meanwhile, you have got a log attached to the side of your face and you trying to help other people with what's wrong with them? What did he call that? Hypocrisy. He said, stop the judging. Stop it. Well, I wasn't judging. There's a good chance if you begin a statement like this, you say, I'm not trying to judge, but guess what you're about to do? judge. Offer up your criticism. Well, I'm just telling you how I see it. How you what? I'm just telling you how I see it. Yeah. How you what? See it? Oh, we don't look at the things that are seen. We don't look at the things that are unseen or with the things that are seen. We look at the things that are unseen because the things that are seen are temporary. Things that are unseen are eternal. You want to know what's eternal? You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. So we got to stop the judging. We have to stop it in our lives. There's no room for it. How do we stop it? We let love compel, constrain, control us. We look through a different lens. We look through the lens of love. Who am I to call worthless what he paid such a high price for? Who am I to despise what he values so highly? What am I saying? Who am I to judge? And what did Paul say? Thus we judge. Here's the decision. Yeah, I saw what you did. I felt what you did, what you did, what you said hurt me. Yeah, all that. Here's my decision. Jesus died. 
He died for you. And that means in God's eyes, you died. And that old man is dead and gone. All things are become new. So here's my judgment. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. See how much faith that takes? And if you got to close these eyes, it might help. It might help. But that's okay, because we don't look at the things that are seen. Looking at things that are unseen. Would you ask the Lord to help you with this? Because I'm asking him. I have experienced this. Years ago, when Sarah and I and our staff, we were in Texas, we had a staff meeting one day. And one thing led to another in our conversation. And for probably an hour, we talked about a church that we had been around, kind of been exposed to. And we sat there and talked this way. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do it like that. Now, this is years ago. We didn't even have a church. And yet we're sitting there criticizing a church. And if you would have said, if somebody would have walked in the room and said, y'all need to quit judging, guess what I would have said? Oh, we're not judging. I'm just telling you what I see. Then guess what you're doing? Judging. And man, my heart bothered me about it, but I didn't do anything about it. That night, all hell broke loose in our house. Sarah and I were fussing with each other, and it was one of those fights. It was like, what are we even fighting about? I don't know. I just went into uh, our master bath and I just started using my trimmer and was shaving. I, I cut myself on my face. Not a big deal. It happens, right? That thing turned into a massive infection. My, my, the whole bottom part of my face swelled up. It was like a golf ball inside my mouth. I couldn't go in public. And it got so painful that in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, I got myself in the car and drove to the emergency room where they had to cut it open. It's like, well, why are you telling us that? You can believe this or not. I don't care. The Lord helped me connect the dots. He did not do this. He did not stir up strife in our house. He didn't cut my face. He didn't give me an infection. But our judgment opened the door to judgment. Now you do with that what you want to do. I know a lot of people don't believe that. That's fine. It was my face. I know what happened. I was there. To judge somebody else is to essentially say, I don't want mercy. I don't need mercy. And who among us would actually say that? I'm not bold enough to say that. I love me some mercy. I want mercy flowing my way all day, every day. I need mercy. If I'm going to constantly and consistently be the righteousness of God in Christ, then it's going to be mercy, 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 washing over me nonstop, nonstop, cleansing of all unrighteousness, the blood that constantly cleanses of everything that is wrong. And the only thing that can stop mercy flowing to me is when I stop mercy flowing through me. And if I judge and I criticize and I pass down my decision based on what I see in somebody else and I decide they got what was coming to them, they don't deserve that or they do deserve this, and I start passing these decisions down, it's like me saying, God, I don't want any more mercy. I don't need any more mercy. And I ain't about to tell him no more mercy. Anybody else love mercy? Show some mercy. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up. Thank you, Lord. This excites me. I, I feel like these are, these are answers. These are fixes to problems in, in relationships and in families. If we can learn to see each other 
and declare with the same faith over them what we declare over ourselves. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Well, then who are you to turn around and judge them? They are too. They are too. Let's lift up our hands and close our eyes. Sarah, come if there's anything you've got to add to this. Father, we thank you today for your word. And we declare again boldly that we are the righteousness of God in Christ because of what Jesus has done for us. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. But I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to help us see through the lens of love. The love of Christ compels, constrains, controls us. I will not judge. Can you make that declaration out loud with me? I will not judge. Say it like this. The judging stops today. I'm not the judge. Say it. I'm not the judge. I'm not the judge. Thank you, Lord. Say it like this. My decision is that they... Now, whoever they is, only you know that. You've got that right now in your heart, your mind. You know who they are. You know who it is. So about they, about them, say this. My decision, my judgment is this. They are the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, listen. What did Jesus say? However you judge others is how you'll be judged. So if you are constantly judging others as the righteousness of God in Christ, you are constantly being judged as the righteousness of God in Christ. That's God's decision about you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I believe that this was um, right on time. I believe this is the answer to kicking over the hill or the mountain of King on the Mountain. That's what that means, where there's strife and discord. That word, it literally paints the picture. He says there's every evil work. This is in James. It paints the picture of King on the Mountain. Who's right? Who's right? My sight, my sight. This is the key to kicking over the mountain and meeting at the cross. Right here. And uh, by his grace, I will to do your will. If my words, if your words, I'm talking for me, have been stout against somebody, or if my words have been, then I need to, I need to go to them, and I need to make it right. I need to apologize. And just as what he um, even said in this house, in my house, in our house, in our marriage, in my home, the judging stops. It's the same thing we do with our children. I'm t- this, this message is something that we are, we are feeding on. Um, and as I was looking at a righteous, a righteous way, right? And I have to put into practice myself um, with my children. You know, there's this pattern that, you know, you always, you always, anytime I address them according to a pattern, I'm prophesying their future because I'm responding out of fear that it happened this, it happened like this, it's going to happen again. Instead of you and me not counting all of these things and not judging these things, I can't even have that relationship that causes one to live for and live after and live under the authority stops today. It stops today. Lord, put a guard over our mouth. Put a guard. Catch us when we say, you are. You know what? You're the righteousness of God. It constrains me, but it also compels me to speak in love. It keeps me from being angry. And when I'm not angry, only then can I speak the truth in love. Only then will my call Hey, just thinking about you, or the text. Hey, just want you to know I love you. Just want you to know it can can truly be authentic. And what you can't see can go to work. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you so much for this word today. You were here accompanying your word. 
working in our hearts, bringing to us the grace and the, the will to do your will. Father, we receive it. In any place that we've stirred up with our words and we've given uh, an allowance for the enemy uh, to come in, we repent right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus that has washed and cleansed. And so we take those words and we thank you. We, we, we repent of those words and we declare life in those places. And we declare Jesus is Lord. And we thank you that love would be a guard over our hearts and over our minds and over the words of our mouth and over this house. In our house. Love would be the guard. And we honor you today. Be honored. Not just on our lips, but Father, in our hearts. As we look at others through your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys today. Um, Happy Mother's Day. Uh, there is a photo booth outside. You can get a picture with, you know, your flowers and all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, we love you guys. Oh, family, I know. Yeah, family, mama. Anyway, God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday night.